Hello and welcome. I'm Laurie Boswell, author of Big Ideas Math, and I'm here this morning with Sophie Murphy. And this is Questions and Answers with Laurie and Sophie. This morning, uh, we wanted to share with you some ideas of, about teaching because we know that uh, through this whole process, we have, uh, for many of us, we've been at this uh, remote or distance learning now for three, four, maybe five weeks. And when it first began, uh, it was interesting. There was almost this, this honeymoon period. We all jumped in, the teachers, parents, students, grandparents, everyone just jumped in. And there was like this real excitement almost at, at the front end. And we all felt like this is really gonna work. We, uh, everybody gave 100%, it felt like it, at least at the beginning. And then uh, there was like this, this flattening, <laughs> this flattening of the curve. And now what I'm experiencing, what I'm hearing and, and what I'm listening to on the news and, and reading in, in blogs and uh, on social media, uh, we're now on that downhill side of it in, in terms of the excitement and in terms of what does learning now look like in this in this new environment and we're finding that that some students have, have simply checked out that they you know that this is not what they signed up for uh, we're finding a lot of a lot of anxiety from parents who who feel like they're needing to homeschool students after they have been trying to teach them after they've been trying to do their own jobs and do the, the work of parenting, and now they feel like they're saddled with, with uh, homeschooling as well. Well, it, it doesn't need to be that way. I mean, parents are not the teacher. We, we still need to remember that there are some very effective strategies that we need to be using in this remote or online environment, and that we can still engage students. And while there are many, many variables, whether we're at the kindergarten level or at the high school level, and whether or not it's uh, with the use of technology or not the use of technology. So I acknowledge there are many variables, but in terms of engaging students and effective teaching strategies, there's still some that we need to be thinking about and practicing as we're in as we are interacting with our, our students during this period of time. So I'm going to turn it over to Sophie right now. And, and Sophie has been working on her PhD with uh, Dr. John Hattie uh, in Melbourne, Australia. And so Sophie, can you share with us some things uh, to remember to keep in the back of our minds as we're still planning our lessons with students? Hi, Laurie. Um, hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And I love our our, our weekly chat, sorry, it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. It, and certainly here in Melbourne, in Australia, we started our school term back today. And so whilst we've been watching and I've been following a lot of uh, the, the people that I'm connected with on Twitter and following all of the blogs um, of people in the United States and globally who are still at school, um, we're about to hit that that starting point of what do I do after people have been quite frightened and quite scared and knowing that school is not going back. And so teachers have worked really hard throughout the last two weeks of the Easter school holidays to find ways to connect online. And I have a 15 year old and a 12 year old myself who started back at school today. So it's, it was interesting to watch uh, and, and to be thinking about them connecting to, to curriculum. Um, you're right to say that, you know, it's very important that we reassure parents and grandparents and carers that they, in fact, are not the teachers, that ultimately they are the number one teacher for their child um, as a parent, but they're not the school teacher. So they're not teaching the curriculum, and certainly in, in regards to mathematics, that um, they could be doing things that bring in mathematical concepts, I would say. But as far as the curriculum goes, then connecting to the teacher and the teacher really thinking about how they can engage in that curriculum um, is absolutely key. I wrote a blog this week um, that was about clarity and purpose. And so talking about the fact that, um, because I've been a teacher for a long time and then moved into the uh, research space at the University of Melbourne, I, I think a lot about um, pedagogical practices and what works and not just my own um, thoughts and feelings, but certainly looking at what the research tells us. And so there are a lot of, uh, quite a number of principles that we can bring into this new remote learning and new online learning um, space that are applicable for our classroom, 
um, but also uh, highly applicable for our online space. So when you're teaching in spaces like you and I are uh, in our own studies and our own uh, mini classrooms that we can do some certain things. And so one of the things that I was talking about that links to my own research with Professor John Hattie at the University of Melbourne is about teacher talk and student voice. And so being able to engage students and to be able to hear their voice. So um, I, I wrote about exit tickets and connecting and really capturing student understanding through exit tickets, but also having clarity of voice. Um, and connecting with voice. So engagement is going to be a really key factor here. Kids are um, potentially quite bored at home and are really looking forward to connecting with their teacher, hearing their teacher's voice, uh, hearing a lesson. And we want to make sure that, uh, as John Hattie would call it, the Goldilocks principle, it's not too easy and not too hard. You know, we really want to challenge kids um, but when we come back to clarity and purpose, we want to have we want to slow down our voice. We don't want to be speaking uh, too fast. So a lot of the research um, that we that we can look at is um, there's some research done by Professor Janet Clinton at the University of Melbourne, who uh, is an evaluator and works at, at the graduate school. Um, she d did a project uh, called Visible Classroom and and still continuing to do so. Um, she found that teachers were speaking, and this is from a classroom perspective, that teachers were speaking at that same conversational pace, which is approximately about 171 words a minute. So it seems like a lot, but uh, interestingly, secondary students could process about the 150 mark, but elementary students and children could only really process uh, on average, about 120 words per minute. So um, when we look at pace, we need to make sure that we're not going too fast or probably too slow because we want to keep kids engaged, but we don't want to go too fast. We want to make sure that they're really processing what we're talking about. Uh, the other one is not talking too much in our lesson, but also that balance of not just not talking at all and getting kids to read off the screen. We want to have a really nice balance of both. Um, and so when we think about speech and we think about pace, we want to also bring in expectations. So having those high expectations of our students. And as I said, really considering that Goldilocks zone. What do you think, Laurie, in the sense of you've been providing Laurie's lessons? Um, what, what advice could you perhaps give when we think about that Goldilocks principle of not too easy, not too hard? Because certainly if, if a teacher is online and doing their lesson and it's far too easy, we don't want that, but we also don't want it to be far too hard as well. So what do you, what have you found? That's a good point, Sophie. And, and certainly when you think about what that balance is going to be, if there is an interaction between the, the teacher and the student, meaning you're doing your uh, remote teaching or distance uh, teaching through the, the medium of, of a video here, and there's this interaction, you can tell from the feedback, both from students and feedback that you're giving to students, what that balance needs to be uh, in terms of the learning. Uh, certainly there, there's the spectrum, and, and we know that uh, because of the number of variables uh, involved here in, in terms of the grade level and, and what the, the learning is looking like, uh, that some students are, are simply not uh, engaged at all, that they're simply receiving a lesson um, that's been pre-recorded and there's no interaction with the teacher. Some are receiving packets, there's no interaction with the teacher. And in each one of those instances, we need to be really careful that uh, what we're asking students to do is indeed uh, at an appropriate level. And uh, the, the challenge is that within any classroom, if you have more than two students, you have diversity. And so you've got to be careful that you're trying to challenge them at, at appropriate levels. Uh, I, I was interested in, in the, the speech uh, piece to this because I know that for myself, uh, I, I can talk rather quickly. <laughs> and so I do need to slow myself down when, when I am speaking. And so it was a good reminder that in the classroom, I have to make sure that, uh, or it, not only in the classroom, but in this, uh, this setting, that I'm slowing myself down so that my speech uh, can be uh, processed and understood yeah. by students.
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that another point is that, and we've, we've talked about this a lot, um, particularly in the big ideas learning text, and you and I um, have presented this together. And this is the idea of really deep level understanding and deep level learning, coupled with a very strong and clear success criteria and a very strong and clear learning intention. So that learning intention being, this is absolutely what we're understanding today. This is what we're doing so that everyone understands exactly what we're doing. And then the success criteria really outlining those steps from surface to deep um, about what, what, what that is. And it's not just about today's lesson, it's how it links to yesterday's lesson and tomorrow's lesson and that learning is sequential. And so we are learning this over a series of lessons and that is evident through a really strong success criteria linked to a learning intention. So people can read about that in the um, Big Ideas text. I've written about that for Big Ideas and you certainly encapsulate that in your lessons um, with the textbooks and with your Laurie's lessons as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sophie. I know that uh, in, in terms of those uh, effective teaching strategies, you, you've spoken about two of them right now in, in terms of the teacher clarity and then also the, the idea that what we are presenting needs to be understood by students and the feedback that we're giving them needs to help them in their learning. It needs to help students assess where they are in their learning, uh, where to next in their, in their learning. Uh, where to next is kind of an, an interesting idea that I'd like to talk um, more about uh, in another session because certainly one of the things that I'm hearing from teachers and feeling myself is that here we are, we are uh, four to five weeks uh, into this, into this um, new environment, depending upon where we are in the country or where we are in the world for that matter, Sophie. And uh, many of us are looking towards the end of the school year right now and saying, gee, for our seniors, some of them have got maybe two to three weeks left. Some of them have five or, or six weeks left. And I look at my curriculum and I say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I have this much left, but I have only this much time. So I think it's really important to, right now that uh, we also be focusing on what are those key understandings that we need to make sure that we are um, presenting to students? That uh, there, there are some standards that are just gonna go by the wayside right now that we really have to look for those major clusters, those major content standards that uh, are important at our grade level or at our course level and understand that next fall, um, and for you, uh, next spring, uh, we are going to need to do some reteaching and some relearning. What is that going to look like? None of us can predict that right now. And, and I, I think a, a message both that you would send and, and I certainly would send is we need to be kind to ourselves right now. We need to acknowledge that there is real anxiety uh, around this, that we did not have the pre-service or in-service training that would have allowed us to, to prepare for this. And we need to be kind and recognize that it's not going to be perfect. We need to remember um, the strategies that you mentioned in terms of the teacher clarity and our, and our um, talk uh, that we have with students, that the pace of our speech and to be thinking now about as we uh, enter the next three to four weeks, what are those major curriculum uh, standards that we want to, to focus on? And it won't be the coherent curriculum that we wanted or that we planned when the school year began, but this one was out of our control. And so be kind to yourself, be kind to yourself. I'd like to thank you for joining with us today. And if you have questions uh, that you would like Sophie and I to, um, to discuss, please make sure that you share those on whatever social media platform you're viewing uh, this video right now. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope that the rest of the re week goes well for you. And thank you, Sophie, for joining with us. Thank you. I look forward to um, perhaps getting some great questions and uh, getting some feedback as well from teachers and, uh, and talking again to you next week, Laurie. Stay safe and look you forward too. to seeing you again. Right. Bye, Sophie. Bye. <laughs>